Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 67, Plague, the Sword, and Unity, Almost. We spoke last week a bit about Gwent and Gluissing, as well as how they were murky corners of Wales. As we reach the end of the 10th century, that is just as much the case as it had been for the previous 500 years. The kings of the area were mostly names on a sheet, and even as they dealt with bigger kingdoms, they were mostly known for paying homage or stirring up problems for the kings of the Murphian line. In effect, they were never anything but side mentions. There was never any stories really about them. There was never anything really historically documented that, that we could go on other than just small mentions in small books. Uh, this, of course, leads to the absence of information, which unfortunately we are left with in those cases. The last half of the 10th century saw little change from this issue. The men of Gower and Gwent continued to fight the kings of the West and the East. They continued to try and force independence, but were largely seen by academics as weak by comparison to their mighty neighbors, and largely under their thumb. As the kings of Wales moved to create a single country, this area continued to elude them. Huel came the closest. His kingdom ruled a large portion of the west and the north, but even he could not overcome the ambitions of his cousin's sons. He could not make it permanent and create a kingdom united under one man, one dynasty, as Alfred and his successors had done in England and as MacAlpine had done in Scotland. However, his sons were not about to simply give up the fight. In 969, Iago and Ayaf, sons of Idwal, finally broke their unity. Iago imprisoned his brother and set the stage for his own eventual downfall. By 973, he was already being sidelined by his nephew Huel, who had been designated heir in 970, probably after some negotiations due to the family conflict. The Murfinians in Gwyneth were struggling to find their way, and Huel was about to ascend to the throne of Gwyneth as Iago had finally worn out his welcome in 974. As the year 1000 approached, Welsh kings were constantly dealing with threats from all places. In the south, the English continued to invade, while in the north, Vikings continued to harry Gwyneth, and the annals mentioned three separate sackings of Anglesey. In this moment, Gwyneth was at the mercy of these forces, and possibly were forced to look for help to fend off the aggressions of the King of Dublin, the Viking Olaf Curren. At Chester in 973, the English King Edgar called together then kings of the northern half of Britain in a conference to deal with the Viking threat from Ireland. Kings from Northumbria, Scotland, the Orkneys, and Wales appeared. According to the list, the kings of Duithbarth and Gwent did not appear at this council, possibly because it was more about the Viking raiders to the north than it was about problems in the south, or it might have been that Edgar, who had been crowned in Bath previously, had already been attended by those Welsh kings and may not have seen the point of atten them attending another meeting. Or it could have been that the kings of the south were too busy fighting each other. Owen Ap Huel reigned over the kingdom of Doithbarth in from 955 until the 980s. He was apparently however, no longer the leader of his people, at least in wars from about the 970s. That responsibility fell to his son, Iannan Ap Owain. Iannan was trying to expand the kingdom at the expense of Gluissing and Morganon, as it was then called in the late 10th century, and continued to push east, taking over the Gower area. It may have been part of the dealings with the active expansion of the kings of Doithbarth that saw the brief combination of Gwent and Gluissing into Morganon. The timing of this coming together has been disputed by academics, as it may have happened as soon as the 8th century, or as late as the 10th century. Either way, it did not last officially or unofficially, as there would soon be other issues that these two kingdoms would face, which would actually end their independence in the invasions of the Normans in the 11th century. At some point in the late 10th century, Gower fell into the hands, finally, of Doithbarth, and Yawin and Owain 
controlled the area. Interestingly enough, and something that we've learned from the history of, of this uh, kingdom is the fact that Owain and Yawen and Meredith, his brother, all had good relationships and generally seemed to get along. There was a note of harmony amongst these brothers which and father, which, let's be honest, was slightly unusual with the Welsh family relations and their tendencies to fight one another. And Kerry Mudd actually posits the idea that the reason why this unity was so important was because what it did was it gave Doithbarth the time to actually look at things in a much more distant approach, in a much more complicated and far-reaching idea, and that idea being the creation of an annal, which basically laid the groundwork for the history that we have now. It prepared the way for our kings and princes of Wales to actually step forward into the historical record in ways other than the brief mentions they get in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and some documents that we've been able to find from that period. It gives us the histories that we work from and build some arguments for. And because of that, of course, they're also biased in their opinion. They're also slanted towards this ideal. And we do know for a fact that the Annals Cambriae uh, A is associated with this group of genealogies and, and this area of Wales at this time. It is suspected that this is when it was actually uh, accumulated and originally written, which would make some sense because the idea that the line of Murfin had been more or less dominant and more or less that it was the only line that really mattered in Wales is very much evidence in the Welsh annals. This is why we get so little exposure to what's going on in Powys right now. It's why Gwent and Gluising and Morganui are so silent by comparison because these guys are writing their history and their ideas about what their history is. And of course, this is a fantastic document. Much like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, it is one of the few ways we know what happened in that period of time. But much like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, it is rife with bias. It's rife with myth-making over actual history, storytelling over you know, trying to get the record straight and tell the real story of things. So in some cases, it wholeheartedly steals from Gildas, from Bede, from old Roman records. It also lifts probably myths and legends that abounded at that time. Like we've said before and discussed at length in one episode, Arthur's story begins with these annals. And we start to get this building of this myth from this era. And in large part, to try and build up a reputation. We, When we did discuss Arthur, one of the things we pointed out was the fact that Mervyn is legitimately, and his line is trying to prove that taking over a kingdom isn't a bad thing if you're a good king. And that's kind of the argument they're making with Arthur, that Arthur wasn't a king, he wasn't necessarily noble, but he had God behind him. And that's why he won victories. And he was ordained by God to be the leader of the British. And so that concept falls into the annals. And we get this kind of sense of destiny out of the Mervyn line that you don't get with a lot of the Welsh lines at this point in time. The descendants of Mervyn are suddenly much bigger, much more important, much more magnificent. I mean, they talk about uh, Owen, for example, as being almost perfect. And they talk about his son, uh, Meredith, as being even more so, and that he will be some fantastic king that we'll talk about for ages on end. And there is some understanding as to why that is, but at the same time, it's obvious that it's slanted by who they're writing it for, which is the kings of Doithbarth. And you ain't going to write bad things about people who you want to get respect, money, property from if you're a church person. And so much like a lot of other things, like, say, Shakespeare writing about 
Elizabethan times, you aren't going to get a lot of negativity towards that period and especially towards that king or queen and their ancestors. You know, this is the reason why you see the destruction of Richard III in, in Shakespearean writings, for example. This all comes from this idea that that he's the victim, you know, that, that Henry VII is this noble character because, of course, he's Elizabeth's grandfather and thus he has to be great because otherwise good old Bill Shakespeare is not going to get the money he needs to be able to do more plays and possibly the plays he'd rather do. So you have that kind of thing going on. And so certainly you know that there is this kind of bias in these stories, in these writings. And like we've said on many occasions, it's important to remember that. But still an incredibly historically important period for the history of Wales. Keep in mind that without the Welsh Annals, we have nothing to tell us what went on here for a very long time. We would be completely absent of information other than the sparse commentaries that happen in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, basically from the time of the death of Bede and the end of the Ninian records, which fall pretty much the same era, all the way up until the 11th century. So there'd be this massive hole in our understanding, a massive lack in what we know. And we already know from Gwent and other places, this is a problem. You would have this massive gap in the Welsh histories and in the Welsh story. And so we we really owe a debt of gratitude to these clergy who wrote this down, but also to the fact that there was this era where they could do that and that it was important and that people were looking at it significantly. Keep in mind, this is exactly the same era where the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, various parts of it start to get written in great detail. And so there is this concept of keeping a record and trying to be at least telling the story and the origin of your people. Again, like I said before, much like when Nennius writes his documents, you can't take them at face value, but they're important. And they're significant, and they contribute to what we understand about Wales. So that's a critically important item to keep track of, and we're going to discuss it in a bit more detail as we go. But let's get back to talking about Eowyn. It's interesting to note that at the same time that his father is, is unable to perform what appears to be his kingly duties as... Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads... But this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show. History is the greatest adventure story. But does it ever leave you wondering what the women were doing all that time? This is Lori from the Her Half of History podcast, and the answer is that some women were seizing power, or escaping slavery, or spying for their country, or creating artistic masterpieces, while countless others were doing the laundry, getting married, and wondering why their clothes don't have more pockets. If you would like to hear the stories of women doing all of those things, check out Her Half of History at herhalfofhistory.com or wherever you get your podcasts. You know, the leader of his people, he isn't falling back into retirement. He's not going off to a monastery. None of these sort of typical things that we see so many medieval and early medieval kings do. In fact, he remains the head of the government and in a way, it's interesting, and it makes one wonder what exactly Eowyn's position is. Is he, as some have contended, a Pentulu, which was the head of a war band, and he would obviously lead the war band of Doithbarth in all of their wars? It was prestigious rank, and it was generally given to relatives and family members of kings, so it does hold considerable influence and weight. At the same time, 
these people in these positions could become a problem for a king who wasn't well loved because obviously they would be the symbol of the next heir to the throne or maybe the more likely option to the throne. So it's interesting that he would have held that position. However, it does seem to show a trust level between the king and his son that his son could hold such an important and prominent position and yet not be held in suspicion. There's no discussion about him overthrowing him. Good grief, this guy was king pretty much for 18 years, not leading his armies, not really being the head of the government. So in a way, it showed an incredible layer of trust. Or could it have been, and we don't really know, could it have been that Owen, in his elderly condition may have been too frail to do anything more than just be the symbol. And so he was important to Eowyn to keep in that symbol, but not able to carry out the function and duties of a king. So thus Eowyn had to take more and more on to try and deal with it all. That's a question we don't have an answer to, obviously, but it is one that's kind of fascinating to think about. What also is interesting is to note that his younger brother, Meredith, becomes incredibly important to the story. He will, in fact, inherit the kingdom from Eowyn relatively quickly after Owen's death. And so that, again, kind of filters that question of, was Eowyn really the power behind the throne? And then his brother, sort of his support system, his person that kept him stabilized and kept him popular with the nobles in the area, even as he ruled as the de facto king of Doithbarth. It, it is a question that we don't have loads of information of, but we do know that Eowyn was important in the defense of the kingdom against Gwyneth, who we are going to get back into here in just a minute. We do know that by the 980s, probably most of the Eastern campaign against Gwent had ended, that Gower was in the hands, probably legitimately in the hands of Doithbarth. And we do know that Eoin leads the defense of his kingdom against Gwyneth in 983, and that he also held Breichenog and... Uh, these lands also would be of interest of his distant cousins from the north. And so these will become the point of conflict between these two as we go forward. We had mentioned earlier that there were some problems to the north at this point, that there had been raids and invasions and attacks in Anglesey in that area, and that these problems continued to go on through the 970s. In fact, by 978... It was said that Gorthfrith ravaged Llyn. And it is in basically this part of Wales, of course, is kind of a key portion of the Welsh homeland for Gwyneth. Uh, obviously, Anglesey is, is this place where the crown resided, but the Llyn Peninsula was sort of the homeland as well, and kind of that place that had remained separate even back in the Roman period, if you remember, we talked about the fact that the Romans didn't do anything in that area. They didn't build a road, they didn't build a fort, they did nothing. And so it had been very separate and very much a part of the early establishment of Gwyneth between its Irish and Welsh roots. This becomes a very destabilizing period. Uh, in fact, Iago, who we talked about earlier, who ended up getting expelled in, in 974, ends up getting captured by, as he's called in the annals, the Gentiles, in all likelihood we're talking about the Vikings, and uh, ends up dying a year later in 980. His brother, Aif, ends up dying himself in 988. He obviously had been released after being imprisoned and then passed away about the same era that uh, Owain did. In the meantime, his own sons, Huel, who became king, died in 985. His brother, Cadwallon, who became king right after him, died a year later in 986. And his other brother, Meg, who did not become king, died in 986 as well. So you have that entire family line killed off very quickly. And killed off by Meredoth, 
who was the king of Doithbarth, and we're about to get into why he was doing that and what the conflict was about. One of the reasons why there's a vulnerability in the north is this conflict between the UF version of the line and the Iago version. And in fact, there is, in the minds of academic Charles Edwards, a symbolic split between the two. And he suggests that possibly the reason why um, Iago is mentioned as being king again around 978 as he may have taken back control from his nephew, Huel, who then turned to the Vikings to help him, and that Guthrith may actually have been an ally of Huel in this war, and thus the reason why this uh, capture and killing of Iago happens, it would then knock him off of control of the line and allow Huel to take command. However, this disunity in amongst the various sons, nephews, cousins continues unabated. And as we said, we see this continue with Guthrith then turning on uh, Huel by allying himself with the son of Iago, Custinen. And together with Guthfrith Haraldson, they then ravish Lynn and Anglesey, and finally, Custon is slain by Huel. And again, the Vikings having collaborated with his enemies, Huel then probably carries out another battle against them and continues to fight with them into the 980s. Of course, the other problem we have here is that the Dublin Vikings were in all likelihood trying to encourage this destabilization of Gwyneth because, I mean, it's fairly obvious, Gwyneth is a key point from Ireland. It was the invasion point, or at least the migration point, from Irish kingdoms into the Roman part of this world. We know that it had been an important position to receive Roman forts, and Roman patrols, it was a form of Roman resistance with the Druids on Anglesey. So it had a reputation for being an important touchstone for the local area. So the idea that it was important to the Welsh communities would obviously be seen as an important resistance point in the Welsh independence and the Welsh control of Wales, even at this time. So if you can destabilize Gwyneth, you destabilize most of North Wales because at this point, Powys is relatively weak. Doithbarth is strong, but they're down in the south. And so it gives them the opportunity, the Vikings in this case, to try and gain influence, gain control by supporting various people to the throne. Not dissimilar to what Edward does, Edward I does, where he uses various contenders and pretenders to the throne to destabilize Gwyneth later on, as Llewellyn is trying to maintain control. So we'll see this kind of thing happen and continue in the history of Wales because of how key Gwyneth is at this point and will be later on. So it's important to note that this is all happening for reasons, and they're obviously important reasons. I think the other thing is, is Doithbarth is well and truly safer from the Vikings, probably a stronger military. And like we pointed out earlier, their unity and the united sense between the family members makes it easier to resist outside pressure, outside influence. The one thing you really don't hear about in this era is Doithbarth being heavily allied or or going off with the English somewhere, with the Vikings somewhere. They seem to be sort of on their own and trying to expand rather than fully unified with anybody. You know, the, the links between Alfred and Wales that happened before aren't as strong now. And so when so while there are still links to the English throne at this point, they're certainly not as strong as they used to be. And as they start to deal with their their Welsh vassal kingdoms there i think there's almost less 
desire by these kingdoms to actually show obedience, if you want to use that term. So that's the reason why southern kingdoms may not have been involved in the northern alliance, if you want to call it that. And it could be the reason why we don't see a lot of talk about this at this point. And at the same time that all of this is going on, we have the end of the line for Owen, the end of the line for Yoan, and the rise of Meredith as king of Doithbarth. And Meredith is a very ambitious king, and he's looking to the north. And what he sees as he looks up there in the mid-980s is a kingdom in complete disarray. First of all, we have an alliance between Huel and his allies in Mercia, specifically Althera, the Elderman of the Mercians. But when Althera dies, Huel is then killed by the English. So whatever happened amongst them at this point, that alliance is gone. This then led to, of course, the dynastic infighting we mentioned earlier, where all the brothers basically were knocked off. And in the process of that, the final survivor of that little confrontation is Cadwallon. And Cadwallon takes possession of Gwyneth, but it doesn't last very long. And effectively what happens is, is Meredith then makes a move on Gwyneth. And he then goes to attack. And if he can then take hold of the kingdom, he will then control most of Wales. But once again, even as he's going to do this, as he gets into the confrontation with Cadwallon and then takes the kingdom, he then runs into that lovely Viking man, Guthfrith, who is still floating around at this point and has just won a major victory in the Battle of Man, the Isle of Man, and now is in alliance with forces from the Hebrides and other places in the Irish Sea, and he then sacks Anglesey, and in the process takes 2,000 captives in 987. In 988, he attacks five separate monasteries, raiding them, taking items from them, and in the end, his consistent pressure forces Meredith to actually pay tribute to these Danes to gain back the captives and to put an end to the fighting. Basically, he paid a Danegeld. And this all happens in about 989. But at the same time, we find that Dublin has a setback. And because of this, they slowly start to be less threatening and less of a problem because of all these reverses that are going on. Um, and so the leadership of the Vikings, the pressure they're putting on the Welsh starts to come to an end. And just as this is happening, we get plagues hitting Wales and causing massive problems for the Welsh in people being obviously ill, a lot of people dying, and all of this ultimately will lead to changes again in who leads Wales. But again, we get very close to a unified Wales at this point. Meredith controls Powys, Gwyneth, Doithbarth, uh, Gower, Brynchenog, and is very close to influencing uh, Gwent and Gluising, or Morgany, as it is called at this point. So he's very, very close. But he never gets there. Again, that little area will stay just out of the reach of the Welsh kings. And again, we will not have the full unity that we that the kings of Doithbarth hoped they would get. But we're closer still to a major turning point for the Welsh and for a new Welsh king to come on the scene, one who will have major effects on the Welsh during the 11th century. And of course, it's the arrival of the Normans to the scene and to the influencing of Wales for the rest of Welsh independence. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for your comments, questions, and concerns that you send me. Uh, if you want to send me any of those, you can reach me at welshhistorypodcast at gmail.com, at welshhistorypod on Twitter, 
You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. Uh, if you'd like to share anything with me that I can send out to others, that'd be great. Uh, and just a reminder, tomorrow is our live stream. Our charity live stream goes tomorrow. You can find that at twitch.tv forward slash distractions media. I know the ad was at the front of this episode. This is our last chance to kind of talk about it. Please, cons- if you can consider giving, it would be wonderful. Anxiety Gaming, the group that we're raising money for, it helps people who have mental health issues to seek help to get the right kind of counseling, the right kind of medical protection, and to be able to live normal lives and to have peer help as well as actually medical help and go so far as to actually help fund people who can't afford it themselves. So they're a very important um, charity. They're one we're very proud to be working with. I hope you'll consider donating. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, We'll talk to you in two weeks. And uh, take care, everybody. Bye. Edge of the Abyss Creations is a proud sponsor of the Welsh History Podcast. Your one-stop shop for unique jewelry, paintings, and other crafty creations. You can find us at facebook.com slash edgeoftheabyss1. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more info, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com. Hey, podcast listeners, I'm Paul Brandis introducing my podcast, Countdown to Dallas. It's a fascinating, in-depth look at the seemingly unconnected events that led to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It's based on my book of the same title. In that book and in this podcast, I go all the way back to 1939 when Lee Harvey Oswald was born into a troubled and dysfunctional family. I'll follow his transient and often violent teenage years and young adulthood, painting a fuller picture of the man who would later become Kennedy's killer. I also take a look at events unfolding in that era like Cuba and Vietnam, and I'll unpack the conspiracy theories too, not one of which has ever been conclusively proven. Subscribe to Countdown to Dallas at evergreenpodcasts.com or your favorite listening app, October 31st.